Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Beer. What do you fear? Is it failure? Humiliation? Rejection? Sickness? Uncertainty of the future? Or death? But what does God say? our hope in distress. He is our light in darkness. Do not fear, for God is with you. God is your strength. God is your help. God will lift you up. How are you today? How are you today? Well, welcome. If you're joining us online, we are glad that you're here with us. We are starting a new series called Feel the Fear. And, you know, all of us from time to time have, have things that cause fear. Certainly the hurricane, Hurricane uh, Florence, caused a lot of fear, caused a lot of uh, trouble in our lives recently. Uh, and, and those things come. They just, sometimes we bring them into our lives. Sometimes they come upon us like a hurricane. Recently, I brought one into my life. A few, just a few months ago, the water was cooler. I was scuba diving off of the coast. Now, I've never scuba dived off of the uh, Virginia Beach coast because I was always told the visibility is really bad. And it is, just in case you're wondering. Terrible visibility. And it was on our day. I went with my son. He, his, he's a new scuba diver. I've been scuba diving, scuba diving for about 25 years. So I, 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 I'm pretty experienced probably about 50 dives or so I've done. And so we go out on, uh, it's a little cold, but, it's, but, but uh, the water was way colder than I had realized. And I didn't realize it until I'm sitting there on the boat. I mean, I'm, I'm there and there's a few other people on the, on the, on the boat with, the, with us. And the, the, the dive master, the guy who's going to go down with us, he starts putting on something that looks like a spacesuit. I've never, I always go down south where it's warmer, so I mean, I just didn't even know what it was. I'm looking at it going, is he going to the moon or something? And then I realized, oh no, he's using a dry suit. That's that thing that they use like in Arctic conditions, you know? And I'm thinking, and I look at my little, my little uh, wetsuit I had on, and I only had a shorty, which is like, you know, a half a suit. You know, it's just like everything's exposed except your core. I'm thinking, I am so hosed, man. I am so, I'm in so much trouble. And I start getting really nervous. My, my, my son, he had a thick wetsuit he uses for surfing in the winter, so he was fine. So they all jump in the water, and I go in last, thinking I better, you know, try to be last in, first out type thing. And I go in, and we start descending, and the visibility's zero. And, and I had never been in, like, zero visibility, so I, was just, I, I didn't even know what that was like. I thought, well, I wonder if I can even see my hand. So I put my hand out, couldn't even see my hand when I extended it. So that's how bad it was. Zero visibility. So I start getting nervous at this point because that's like, those are like dangerous conditions. Because you have a buddy and the dive master was going to go off with these other two people that were kind of new. And I was, my buddy was my son. And so how do you communicate if you're, you know, you, something goes wrong with your regulator, the thing that, you know, feeds you air. What if you had some other kind of emergency, you get tangled up, you get disoriented. Any, there's no way to communicate that. You can't see the person. So I'm thinking, well, I don't know. I'm kind of like hesitating, hesitating. I'm fearful. I'm freezing. I'm like shaking. So we descend to the bottom of the ocean. We were doing a wreck dive. So I thought, well, maybe we'll just like see the wreck or see the wreck, you know, and then leave as quick as we can. And so we go around the wreck and it's really hard. You can't really see it. We're just like feeling it as we go around and total waste of money, by the way, you know, so, so we're going around, 
uh, all around this, this wreck. And we get to the, all the way back and I'm kind of, you know, it's time to, we're, we're getting close to surfacing, you know, the air's going low. And so we decide though to go uh, through the wreck, you know, through the hole. So I'm following my son because I'm the more experienced diver. I'm trying to keep an eye on his fin, the fins that are right in front of me. And we go through the hole. He comes up through and he's smaller than me and he goes through this, this opening on the, on the other side of the wreck. I get stuck. I'm like, you know, my tank's too big. It's not me, it's my tank, you know. <laughs> so I'm like stuck in the thing. And, and then and then what really what got me stuck was I, somehow I had gotten tangled up with some, some thick fishing line. And, uh, and so I, I was like, I had fishing line on me. He's going off. So I, I go to grab my knife because on the butt of my knife, I have a piece of metal that I can hit my tank to signal to the diver. I forgot, and all of the crazy stuff that happened, and I, my, my fear up on the boat, I forgot my knife is, is up on the, it's not doing me any help, and I can't cut myself free. And then I see my son like disappearing into the murky water. And I'm, I'm at the bottom of the ocean, stuck in the hole of a ship, which is, you know, that's scary. You know, I don't know, if that's just, just think of it. I, I was afraid, that's all there is to it. Fear, grip me. And I'm like, oh no, you know, everybody's gonna go down, you know, so, so, uh, in a desperate attempt to free myself, I just start, I start spinning and, and then kicking as hard as I can, hoping to break the, the fishing line. And fortunately, I, that worked. I broke the fishing line. My son was gone by then. So I'm thinking, well, he went in that direction. So I swam as far as I could, I mean, as quick as I could in that direction. And I ended up catching up to him. And then we surfaced. Now we lived and everything's okay. But <laughs> it was fearful. And fear happens. Sometimes we bring that stuff into our life. Certainly I brought that one into my life. There was a number of points, things I could have done to not end up in that situation. And sometimes it just calms. You know, but, you know, it's not really, like, cool to admit you, you have, you know, you're afraid, right? That's like, nobody wants to admit that. But, it, but there's things to be afraid of. I mean, there's things that we're afraid of in relationships. We're thinking this relationship's going to blow apart and it means so much to me. My, you know, if you have kids, you, you, you can have, certainly have a lot of, fear things associated with kids. Are they going to be okay? Or will they be safe? Will they get hurt? Will they end up on drugs? How am I going to pay for their school? How will I pay for the college? I mean, there's all kinds of fear stuff. Fear with finances. How can I pay for the next bill? What if my car breaks down? I don't have money to fix that. How am I going to pay for college? How am I going to pay for, how, how, you know, how am I going to save for retirement? I mean, all of the things that are associated with that and fear of, our, of, of health. You know, what if I get an illness? What if I get an STD? What if I get sick? What if somebody I, I love, a loved one gets sick? I can't afford medical insurance. And, you know, what if I end up in a nursing home? I mean, there's so many things. Fear of loneliness and, and, and all kinds of fears. And we're going to talk about a number of those over the six weeks. But today what I want to do is talk about the root of fear. Where does it, you know, the root, where does it come from and how do we deal with it? And to do that, we're going to look in a story in the Bible that is, is it's one of the most fearful situations, but it's also one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It's the story of the Red Sea. If you have your Bibles, open it, open it up to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to, we're going to read that passage and kind of look at that because it really does help us to see how to deal with our fear because that was a fearful situation they were in. You have Moses and the people of, of Israel. They were enslaved for 400 years. God then brings Moses as the deliverer. There's all these plagues that happen. Pharaoh says, you know, and, and Moses keeps saying, hey, let my people go. Finally, Pharaoh says, you know what? Get out of here. And they leave. This happened. So five days earlier than the story in Exodus 15, they leave and then... Here they are five days later, and they're stuck in a, in between two mountains and a sea, a red, the Red Sea. And they're, and they're kind of in this cul-de-sac. And this is where we pick up the story here, because Pharaoh changes his mind. So he gets on his chariots. They all, they're going to go. They're going to kill a bunch of people. They're going to enslave the rest. And here's, here's what it says. As Pharaoh approached. They're stuck. They're in this cul-de-sac. Pharaoh's approaching. The Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were understandably terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. Heart attack time, scared to death. Oh, no, we're going to either die or be enslaved again. This is terrible, and they react. Now, there's four common reactions to fear. When we get caught up in fear, 
four common reactions. We see the Israelites fall into these very things. For Number one, fear can make us skeptical. It makes us question. It makes us doubt. It causes us to doubt ourselves, doubt other, doubt God. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to die in the desert? So you can just hear in their language the sarcasm, you know, like, hey, you couldn't find a better place to let us die? You have to do this? I mean, they're ridiculing them. They're skeptical. They're sarcastic. And when you, those, that's, when you have somebody in your life, somebody at work, somebody in your home, who's acting like that, very cynical, very skeptical, you know, they're, they're, the reason behind it is fear. Fear is at, at work. Number two, fear causes us to be selfish. They, when we focus on ourselves, our own needs, and they say there in verse 11, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? So they're blaming Moses. And you know, there was a book written back in the 1970s, very popular book, Looking Out for Number One. It was a book on self-confidence. But that very title is a statement of fear. If I don't look out for me, nobody else will. I got to look out for number one. I've got to be selfish. I got to be concerned about me. Those are statements of fear. I'm afraid. I'm not thinking of the bigger picture. And I'm certainly not going to, I'll blame other people if that's needed. This is real common in corporate America. Mistakes are made. When mistakes are made and things happen, and it, it, what happens? Do the, the, the boss rarely owns it, right? They're hiding behind people. They're afraid of the shareholders, of the stockholders, of the media, all kinds of things. Same thing with politics. Politics, all the things that happen, and bad decisions in government. Who's owning those mistakes? I don't see too much of that on either side of the aisle. I mean, everybody's, because they're afraid, right? They're afraid of their reputation. They're afraid of being called names. They're afraid of, of, the, of the ballot box. They're afraid of their supporters, their fun, the, the people that fund them. All, and, and fear causes us to be selfish. Number three, fear causes us to be stubborn. Verse 12, did we not say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. And so this is another reaction to fear. We're stubborn. We're obstinate. Some of you, and you have somebody like that in your life. They're obstinate. They're bullheaded. They never want to change. And it's, you know, don't, don't rock the boat. And the thing that's behind that is fear. Fear's at, so if you just try to have an argument or a discussion at that level of, why don't you want to change? You know, well, you got to deal with the fear that's behind that. Because that is often what goes on with, uh, with fears is people respond being obstinate, being stubborn. Number four, fear causes us to be short-sighted. There in verse 12, it says, It would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than for us to die in the desert. So they... I mean, there's this tendency to live in the past. You know, it was horrible in, in, in Egypt. There they were mistreated. They were enslaved. They were, they were all kinds of terrible things that happened. And here they are. They're, they would rather have that than risking freedom, risking what the, the unknown is. And there's, you know, a lot of people like that, that they would rather stay in their circumstances as miserable as they are Rather than, rather than take the risks of the unknown. And, and there's a lot of people. That's often why we stay in our habits. So many of us have habits that we're not, we're not happy with. They're self-destructive in many cases. They're certainly not helpful. They don't really help us progress in what, what God wants us to do. And we stay in those Many times because of fear. We're afraid of the unknown. What if I really start making changes? How will people treat me? What will people perceive of me? What, what, they might misunderstand me. You know, they might come against me. All kinds of things that we, we, we imagine in our, in our minds that causes us to have fear. And we stay, we stay where we're at. Sometimes that, that's why people don't want to set goals. They're afraid of dreaming. Why? The fear of failure. What if I don't fail? What if I fail? What if, and we certainly, if I set a goal, I can't tell anybody because then I have egg on my face. So again, fear causing us to be short-sighted. We're not willing to take risks because of fear. So 
This is something that can happen to all of us and does happen to all of us. So certainly we need to address that. Moses does a good job, by the way, of addressing it. These, all these people are coming to him. They're afraid. They're coming up. We're afraid, Moses. And Moses is cool as a cucumber. I mean, he's calm. His reaction is very, very measured. He doesn't, get, he doesn't take it personally. That's a thing that often happens, right? People, they start complaining. They come at us with all these, you know, blaming. And, and we can take it personally. He sees through it all. He knows there's just fear at work. And so he does not respond that way. And certainly we want to respond like Moses. We want to be people that, People of faith, people that don't get gripped with fear. How do we do it? Well, let's look at what Moses did. Three things. Number one, let go of your fear. If you have fear going on, if you have fear coming at you, you got to let go of that. Moses answered it. He says, right at him, he points it out. All the things they're saying, he goes, do not be afraid. He just, he just names it. There's fear going on. He goes, do not be afraid. And what he's saying is, is that God is part of what we're doing. He's part of the story. And so you can cast your care on him. You can remember that God loves you and recognize that he has power to save you. That it's, it's, and that's something we have to remind ourselves. Remind ourselves and remember God is able. He is here. We serve a living God and God cares about us. God, and that is true. God cares about you and he's in control. Now notice in verse one, if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hiroth between Megdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea. So he tells them exactly where he wants them to go. Right between here, these mountains, and there's a sea there. Just camp right there. So who brought, here the Israelites are in this impossible situation. They're really in a cul-de-sac, an impossible cul-de-sac. Who brought them there, as we see in verse 1? God did, right? God said, I want you to go there. This is important because when we find ourselves in a very difficult situation, an impossible cul-de-sac, we have to remind ourselves that God is the one who brought us there. And so wherever God guides, God, he provides, right? He provides. You go, well, wait a minute, Andy. Wait a minute, time out. I'm not sure God brought me here. You might not realize it, but I make some dumb choices, some dumb mistakes sometimes. I think I might have brought me here. You know, I mean, God didn't get me in debt. I got my, me in debt. And now I'm st I have this mountain of debt, and I don't know, this impossible situation I don't know how to get out of. Or I'm in this terrible marriage, and, you know, and, and I don't know how to get out of it, but I'm the one who said the vows. God didn't say it. And so we discount God's role in that. And we just say, well, it's, and you know what? We do have free will. There's no doubt about it. We have free will. And along with that free will means we make dumb choices. But here's what we see about God all throughout the Bible. Is God is so good that he is able to incorporate our free will, a.k.a. bad choices. <laughs> our free will, the things we do, the good things, and the bad things, the dumb things. And he integrates that into his will. And it becomes part of his plan for us. He doesn't like just discount us. Like, oh, well, you ruined everything. So you're on your own. Good luck. <laughs> it's not the way I want it to go. Just remember that. You know, you might have been raised in a home where that's where you were taught. Hey, you met your bed. Now you sleep in it. And that's fine if some people want to parent that way. But God doesn't do that. We don't see that. That's not consistent with, with what we see in, in the Bible. Look at this, this situation we're looking at today, this story. The Israelites, here they are, they're trying to, they're, they're in slavery, they just get out, just five days early, here they are, they're in a terrible situation. How do they get there? We have to go back 400 years. 400 years earlier, you had their forefathers make some dumb choices. Isaac made a dumb choice, Jacob made several, he had 12 kids, 10 of them made a stupid decision, and they sold one of the kids into slavery, he ended up in Egypt, and then... And then you have Joseph, who's the one who sold into slavery. He ends up becoming, you know, getting freed. It's a whole story, but he gets up with his dad and says, hey, why don't we move everybody to Egypt? The pharaohs love us. <laughs> I mean, we're like pharaohs. When we walk by, I can high five the pharaoh. They love us, man. This is the place to be. Let's come to Goshen. That was a bad decision. 
Bad call. And so they end up in Egypt. That pharaoh dies. The next one goes, you know what? I don't like you guys at all. <laughs> Boom. 400 years of slavery. Bad choice. And there's other bad decisions. I'm just pointing out some. But my point is, is that they find themselves in this situation and God is with them. God is the one who said, you go to this place. It's what was bad is going to get worse. But all along, he has a plan for them. It's not like God's like trying to figure it out on the fly. Whoa, that was a bad call. Let me see. I open up the sea. No, he knew all along what he's going to do. He knew what Pharaoh was going to do. And so this is important because some of you are in an impossible situation. You're in a miserable place. You're in a place that looks so, un like there's no hope. And I am telling you that God wants to deliver you and he's with you and he already has a plan to do it. And it's your response now. Your response to come alongside and say, yeah, God, I want your plan for my life. And so you, you need to let go of that fear. You, you got to realize God is bigger than my problems. God is bigger than the problems that I have. Now, why does God even allow us into impossible situations? Well, we see two reasons. Number one, it's because it's for God's glory. God, it's, God wants to move on our behalf. He wants to be that supreme uh, being in our lives, the, the, our creator, and he, and, and he wants us to recognize that. Exodus 14 there in verses 3 and 4 says, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around in the land of confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh... So I'll gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. God even told them, in advance, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let this thing get so bad, and then you'll just, there's, there's no answer but God coming through. The problem that you have is allowed to be in your life so that a miracle could come. If you didn't have a problem, you wouldn't need a miracle. If you didn't have this impossible cul-de-sac you find yourself in, you would need God's deliverance and God, and God to be glorified in that situation. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is because we grow in it. We grow for your growth. God wants us to grow in our faith. How do you go, grow in your faith? How do you stretch that? If you want to grow in your muscles, why don't you go to the gym? Throw some weights around. How do you develop your faith? How do you grow that faith muscle? Well, by being put in tough situations. Situations where it takes faith to actually get through it. James 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Whoa, joy. Uh, that's not my response. So, well, let's see what he says. Hear him out, hear him out, okay? For when your faith is tested. So he's talking about you have joy because... God wants to grow you in faith, and this is how it happens. When you're in a difficult spot, your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, and so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. So if you are facing a personal Red Sea right now, God is saying, hey, I'm with you. And here's what you need to know. When you're a child of God, he is your father and everything goes through his hands. Everything goes through his hands. And so everything is father filtered. And so it doesn't matter how you ended up there, whether it's your fault, somebody else's fault, how much God led you there. But God says, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to, I have a plan to rescue you. I have a plan to give you strength and hope and, and deliverance. Deliverance certainly is a big part of what God does in healing. All these things. You see, God has a good plan for you. The enemy does not. But God's plan always is good. You say, Andy, why don't I always get good? Well, sometimes we're still in the process. We're still walking towards the cul-de-sac where we're going to be in. But God all along has a plan for his deliverance for his people. Number two, we look up. So this is an important part. Certainly we want to not be afraid, but we also have to look up and look to God. There in verse 13, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Now notice he says, stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring you today. 
The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. So this is this idea of standing still. When we're afraid, our tendency is to run, right? Not to stand still. So standing still is like the opposite. You know, just stand still. Stand still. If I was the Israelites and you're hemmed in, I'd probably be running in a circle. I, I got to do something, right? Run. I can't run. They couldn't run away. Stand still. When you can stand still, you're able to look up. You can't look, you can't look to God. It's hard, it's really like hard or impossible to look up when you're running. By standing still, you can look up. Recently, we bought a dog in our home. It's a, it's a, gold, it's a golden doodle. And so our little dog's about nine months old. So it's been terrorizing our home, <laughs> destroying things. And I'm trying to intervene and, and, and teach the dog good behavior. So I'm teaching the dog behaviors, things like, uh, you know, come, sit, stay, leave it, those kinds of things, right? <laughs> and, there's, and then I do some other little tricks too, like jump through a hoop and stuff. But those, those are like little parlor tricks, right? But above all of the tricks that I'm trying to teach my dog, there's one that supersedes all of them, one that's more important than all the other. And those are important tricks, you know, important behaviors. Come, sit, all those things, you know, off. One's above all of those, and it's the word, uh, watch me, words. Watch me. Watch me. And I point to my, my face, to my eyes, watch me. And I'm training, that, and I regularly work that into all of them. And the reason is because uh, my trainer says that dogs, they have a hard time generalizing. And so you can teach them some kind of trick or behavior like in your living room or your den, but then you go outside in the backyard and then they forget it because all of a sudden there's squirrels running around, there's all these distractions. You take them somewhere else, like to the dog park or to the stores, and they totally forget, they forget it real easy. Because, oh, that, no, that behavior was for over there, not here. And they have a hard time generalizing. And so by saying, watch me, they, it helps them to pull away all those distractions and focus in. And then when they hear the command, they go, oh, yeah, I know what to do. I'm supposed to do that command. It doesn't matter where I'm at. And so watch me. Watch me. You know, God is saying that to some of you. You're in a difficult spot. You have distractions. You have things that are pulling at your emotions, at your, at, your, at your sanity. And God is saying, watch me. Look at him. Look at him. Look up. And you can't do it at the same time. You're all stressed out in fear. That's why you, he, says, stand, he says, stand firm. Be still and learn to look up and to watch and to watch God. Now, it's, it's, it, as I said, it's ironic because they can't run anyways. And so here they are, they're stuck, but he still says, no, don't try to even attempt to run. Watch me. Watch, watch God. The lesson here is, is that God often allows us to go even to the very last second, you know, before he brings the answer because that's where our growth happens. You know, as we're, as we're being stretched, that's, we don't like it, he could have done the miracle on day, you know, five days ago, you know, but instead he waits until we're in this very difficult spot because it grows us. It's a test of our faith. And then number three is to launch out. In other words, at some point, there's this something you've got to do. You've got to move. You've got to do something to respond. It's, it's no longer time to stand and sit and wait. Look at this, verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Is, I wonder if uh, what God thinks that's what we're doing sometimes when we're praying, you know. Uh, I'm done. Just quit your crying. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Living Bible translates it, quit praying and get people moving. It says, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. See, there's a time to pray and there's a time to forge ahead. There's a time to be contemplative and reflective and, 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 and uh, maybe fasting or whatever you do, meditating, and then there's a time to get up and you do something. And this was their time. Faith is a verb. Faith is a something, it's an action step. 
we actually have to do something, you know, to demonstrate, to grow in our faith. And we, we all have faith. You, you, you actually use your faith all the time. You had faith that this, the seat that you sat in would hold you up. And it's, it's good that it did, right? You say, oh, that didn't take a lot of faith. Well, some things take more faith than others. You know, if you get sick, you go to the doctor and you go, you know, he writes down, you know, scribbles something on a piece of paper and gives it to you. You look at that and you go, well, I hope the pharmacist can understand that because, I mean, it's, it's like chicken scratch, which I think the doctors do that on purpose. You give it to the pharmacist, right? They look at it, they go, ooh, uh, I think that's, and you're like, uh, no, 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 I got it. Call me, I got it. And then they put some, some powder and some pills and they go, here you go. This should make you better. And then what do you do? You take it, right? You're putting faith. We use our faith all the time. It's just, how do we use faith? And God says we need to put our faith in him. We step out and we say, and, and God's calling you to do some, something. Where you're supposed to step out and do something. Some of you need to speak up. And I was praying about it when, when, during the, the song portion of our, of our service. And I just felt like that. I felt like God said, there's some people that you are, you're, you're being uh, uh, treated poorly or you're, uh, you know, being called names or, or harassed at work or in some situation and, 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 you're, and you're not sure whether you should say something. And I'm telling you, for some of you, that is what God wants you to do. And you know, you know if it's you. Where you, yeah, I wasn't sure this past week. Well, you need to say something. You need to stand up and you need to speak up. You need to speak up if you know somebody's being hurt. You need to be speak up if you know something's wrong. God gave you a mouth, and he's going to give you courage with that because that's what it takes. It's not just a mouth, but you, if you get locked up in fear, then you don't say anything. So you've got you to speak up. And uh, I'll pray with you to, to be able to do that. You know, there's normal emotions of fear, and then there's, there's ones that are... That are, that are beyond normal. A normal emotion of fear, I mean, if you have fear, that's, that's a normal thing, right? I mean, we all have fear. I had fear, Sharon and I had fear this past, this past week. We went to my niece's wedding in L.A. And uh, we went to this, this urban environment. It was like down in downtown L.A. It was a repurposed warehouse. I'd say renovated, but it wasn't. It was just a repurposed warehouse. And so they have the ceremony right there. We go into the warehouse, and it's all cinder blocks, and so the music's like super loud. I mean, not just, you know, not, not just decibels, but it's reverberating. And, you know, and as the night progresses, it gets dark. And Sharon and I go, you know, well, let's just take a break outside for a second. So we go outside, and we sit down on this bench that's on this, like, there's this lattice wall. And there's a bench right next to it. So we sit next to it and we're resting, laying down, you know, kind of resting on the lattice wall. And then somebody comes out and they come up with this weird face on their, uh, weird expression on their face. They go, you know, there's a cockroach right over your head. <laughs> and so I look behind, Sharon and I both look, I look behind. Well, it was dark. So the guy thought there was only one cockroach. The whole wall was cockroaches. It was like something from the mummy. It's just like, ah, oh, you know, I mean, I just, I'm backing up, checking my hair, you know, what in the world, you know. Because they weren't there before when it was light out, I guess the dark, and then the music, and, you know, and they're, they're dancing or whatever. I mean, they're come, all, the, all the cockroaches come out. Turns out we had somebody go around the backside. There was like piles of trash and mattresses all on the other side of that wall. But that was creepy. I mean, like, ah, oh, that's, that's a normal emotion of fear. But there's something that is not normal. It's spiritual. It's, a, it's called a spirit of fear. And here's what the difference is. See, the spirit of fear wars within you, keeping you from what God has for you, keeping you from following God, keeping you from risk-taking. This is a spirit of fear. There's a young man, a guy named Timothy, who was the, the pastor of a church in Ephesus, and he struggled with that for some reason, maybe his age, who knows, but... He had the spirit of fear in his life. And so Paul writes a letter and, and tells him, hey, listen, that's, that's not from God. Notice what he says right here. He says, for God has given us, a, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love 
and of sound mind. This is God's reward to you, his blessing for you. Power, love, a sound mind. And those are the things you need when you're afraid. You need to know God's power is with you. That he loves you, that he's, that he's watching over you, and that only good, he, only, he only has good for you. And that, that gives you a sound mind. You know, I don't have to be all anxious. I don't have to have my sleep all ripped apart. I don't have to be just in knots and my ulcers and all the things that happen to our lives when we're gripped in fear. He goes, no, I have power, love, and a sound mind for you. But it means you have to believe for that. You have to step into that. It just doesn't come on its own. Verse 16 said, raise the staff and stretch out your hands over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go, what? Through the sea. He brought them through it. And this is true with our problems, our impossible situations. God usually brings us through it, not around it. It's, you know, we go through it and in that process of going through it is where we really grow in our faith. Verse 21, then we'll close. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into a dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. How would you like to be in that situation? Pretty scary, actually. I mean, God's delivering you, but every step is a step of faith. What if you, you could be, you know, second-guessing yourself, especially if you have a spirit of fear. Oh, well, what if he decides he doesn't love me anymore? You know, what if he, all of a sudden you remember some stuff that you did that's unconfessed sin? Oh, no, unconfessed sin. And, you know, and you, what if that water falls back in on me? And then at some point, you know, you're like halfway and you go, well, you know, it's just as far forward as it is back. I might as well keep moving. You walk through it. You walk through it. You don't let that stuff keep you back. Now, as a church, my prayer for this church is, is that we stay people of faith, risk takers. This is not a given. This is not a given. You know, organizations, not just churches, but all organizations, they, they have this tendency to become more cautious, more conservative, more they, they hold back. I mean, a, a, a startup business, they have nothing to lose, right? And then they start getting profit coming in and they start gaining some assets and they get a reputation and they start going, oh, I don't know, I don't want to risk it anymore. And that might be okay for a business, but that is not okay for a church. Sharon and I started this church 24 years ago. And when we started this church, it was we didn't have anything. It was just Sharon and I and, and a few people in our house and, and when we moved to a school and from a school to the Cinema Cafe, Cinema Cafe to this old Cardinal Racquetball Club and then we renovated it and just each time God just, this, the story of this church is God's grace and people's faith. That's, that's all it's been. God's grace and people's faith. And I want it to continue to be like that. I don't, want to, I don't want us just to get settled and go, okay, well, we got our place and let's just, re what if God calls us to do something big? Or, I don't want to, we can't shy away from that. And that's true of you individually. That's, our, that's as a church. But you, 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 you have to make a choice every day to get up and say, today I'm going to live for, in faith. And if God calls me through something, a difficult situation because he wants to grow my faith. He wants me to walk through it. I'll give him glory. I will grow through this circumstance. Then I would pray that you would be willing to do that. God has power for you, love. He wants to give you a sound mind. He doesn't want you to fall into that camp where you're skeptical or selfish, where you're short-sighted, you're afraid of dreaming anymore. Fear can rob you. You can exist with fear, but you can't live with fear. You can't really live the way God wants you to live. And so you need to deal with that. I mean, we talked about the roots of that. We talked about how to resolve that. How you have to, the best way is to face your fear straight on. And you just say, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to look to God. And then I'm going to launch out. I'm going to do, if God tells me to do something, I am going to do it. For some of you, if you're far from God, 
The way you launch out is to put your faith in Christ. You step out. That means by praying. You say, God, yes to Jesus Christ. Thank you for coming and dying on the cross for me. And you put your faith in him. You say, today I'm going to actually step out and, and trust you. And I'm going to pray with you to do that. For some of you, you've already made that choice, but you've never been water baptized. And that is your next step. You need to do that. You need to make a decision today that because we're doing one in one month, the 13th and the 14th of next month. Say, I'm going to get baptized. And if, you, uh, if you've never been baptized, Jesus said, Jesus did it himself. He got baptized. He said, I, and, he, and he said, he goes, I want to be a role model. I, want, I don't want to, I don't want to ask my followers to do anything I haven't done myself. So he, he didn't need to get baptized, but he did. He says, I want everyone who says they're a follower of Christ to be baptized. And so for some of you, that is your next step. You say, Andy, I was baptized as an infant. Well, that's for your, your parents baptized you. I'm great. I'm, I think that's wonderful. I was baptized as an infant. But at some point, that was their faith. At some point, I need to act on my faith. And I needed to get baptized. And so I did. For some of you, it's getting into growth track and taking that next step. Say, I want to make a difference with my life. I want to serve along other people that are, that are changing their communities and making a difference. And that's your next step is to be part of growth track. I'm going to pray with you. What, and some of you have things that are very unique to you that you know, if you really pray about it, God's saying, I, you need to take another step here. You need to move forward. And the thing that's holding you back is you're afraid. And so I'm going to pray with you right now that the spirit of fear does not have hold on you. You can recognize that, hey, I'm afraid, but it's not a spirit of fear. And that way you can move forward with what God has for you. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray right now. Well, Lord, I just invite you right now into this space, right here. Lord, I, I pray for those who are in impossible situations, whether they played a role in it or they're a victim or it doesn't, all, what all the th reasons why, really at this point, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you find yourself in an impossible situation and you need God to show up. And so, Lord, I pray, I pray for your power, for your love to be manifest right now, right here. And the very next step for some of you is to make a step, launch out to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And this is not about joining Vineyard, not about joining a church. This is about about going to God and saying, I'm going to activate my faith. Because we put faith in things all the time. But today, it's about putting your faith in what Christ did for you. And so I'm going to pray for you. If, you're not, if you've already received Christ, I'm going to ask you to be praying for the people next to you. Praying that they, because their eternity really hangs in the balance right now. So I'm going to pray with you. Right where you're at, I'm not going to ask you to to embarrass yourself in some way, but I'm going to ask you to pray along with me because you may not know the words to pray. So you just follow me in your prayer by putting your faith in Christ. Would you pray with me just right now to say, Dear God, I know I'm not very close to you. The truth is I'm far away. And say, God, today I want to come home. Today I put my faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. Would you say, God, forgive me for the things I've done wrong, for poor decisions, for ignoring you. Would you say today, God, give me a fresh start. Give me hope. Help me to sense your presence, your power, and your love in my life. And then if you're in an impossible situation, regardless of where you are, would you say, God, help me to look not to the circumstances around me. For some of you, God's word for you is this, watch me. I mean, you, you're, maybe you're struggling with generalizing. Maybe you hear about God's love in here, in this place, but then you go out and you forget with all the worries and the problems of the world, all the things that are going on. 
And so maybe God's word for you is just tomorrow or later today. Remember God's word when he says, watch me, stand firm, look up. God, I thank you for your, your, your ability to reach into our lives, how much you care for each one of us. Help us, Lord. Experience your power in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.